Okay, um, welcome everybody uh, to the first um, uh, ERCnet webinar after the summer holiday. Um, so I'm hoping everybody is refreshed uh, uh, now. Um, and um, today we actually have an ERCnet ESPN joint webinar on uh, uh, diabetes insipidus. Uh, and our primary speaker today is uh, uh, Professor Daniel Bichet, um, who is a professor of medicine, pharmacology and physiology at the University of Montreal and a staff nephrologist at the Hôpital du Sacré-Cœur in uh, Montreal as well. And after finishing his um, medical training, um, he did a research fellowship at the University of Colorado uh, under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Robert Schreier. Uh, but now uh, Professor Bichet is himself a, a well-renowned scholar um, and was decorated with numerous medals uh, and awards from professional organizations in the field. Um, with respect to the topic of today, um, together with Mariel Birnbaum, Prof Professor Bichet published in 1992 in Nature the first mutations responsible for X-linked uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and continues to follow uh, and guide large number of patients with congenital polyuria, uh, ADPKD and uh, Fabry disease. Um, but before giving the floor to Professor Bichet, it's important to mention that today again uh, we have a patient uh, giving voice to the patient perspective. Um, and that's Lucas van Balen, uh, whom you already uh, see, um, uh, and whom I would already like to thank very much for his uh, for his commitment today. Um, before giving uh, Professor Bichet the floor, uh, I would like to remind you that you can ask your questions in the uh, question box, and I would like to uh, ask you to ask a lot of questions in the question box so that we can have a, a lively discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, Professor Bichet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom, for this uh, nice introduction. So it's a pleasure for me to participate uh, to uh, these uh, series, uh, conferences. And uh, I would also like to say that all these slides presented here um, are uh, for you and so that uh, you can use them. And if, uh, obviously, um, I would enjoy some questions, uh, you know, during and um, after the uh, conferences or even after. That means that you can contact me uh, by email uh, without any problem. And, and so this is some way an informal type of conference. Next slide, please. So that uh, this uh, slide is, in fact, from uh, investigators that were used to work in Nijmegen, that is uh, Nine Knurs. And uh, I will present today my research concerning nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. But at the same time, there were many investigators, including um, European investigators, participating to uh, the new identification of, of genes. Um, and so that I would like to say that. Next slide, please. So these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, so I'm not uh, very young anymore. So I'm a consultant for many uh, pharmaceutical companies. And I'm also writing chapters on diabetes insipidus, including diabetes insipidus renalis for up to date. And uh, this is described here. Next slide, please. So. Uh, maybe uh, I would um, attempt to tell you how this AVPR2, that is this gene coding for congenital nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the X-linked variety, was uh, discovered, was identified. It codes for the vasopressin V2 receptor and mutations in that particular gene are responsible for X-linked nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. But there are other important genes also, like AQP2, uh, the gene uh, coding for the aquaporin 2, and Peter Dean from Nijmegen also uh, cloned uh, with uh, this team uh, this gene and identified and characterized many different mutations. I will also speak not only of loss of function of the vasopressin V2 receptor, but also of gain of function. That is a reverse type of phenotype uh, uh, responsible for hyponatremia. That is too much water as compared 
compared to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which is a loss of water. Next slide, please. So just to tell you that vasopressin is a hormone, we are going to speak about vasopressin receptor, but uh, the hormone was known and for a number of years, and in fact, for 122 years, in 1901, as you can see here, there was demonstration of activities on the oxytocic vasoconstrictor and antidiuretic activities of pituitary extracts at the time, you know, all the pituitary extract were not some way solved, but it was found that it has some antidiuretic activity. And even in 1913, there was some treatment of central diabetes insipidus. That is the deficiency of the hormone per se, not of the receptor. And Farini and Van den Velden were treating successfully central diabetes insipidus. That is the deficiency of the vasopressin hormone itself. The pressure effects was first identified for vasopressin, so that the V1 effect are referring to that first identification of vasoconstrictor effect. It was later on in the 1940s that the antidiuretic effect were found, hence uh, the uh, denomination V2, for V2 receptor that is responsible for the antidiuretic effect. And as you can see here in 1955, Vincent Duvigneault was awarded the Nobel Prize because he was able to sensitize the hormone per se. It was quite a feast at the time. Next slide, please. So again, these are the antidiuretic effect on the left part of your slide and the pressure effect on the right part of your slide. If you measure the hormone in the blood, and if you do some slight dehydration, that is, you increase plasma sodium on the left part of your slide by simple dehydration, you will increase plasma vasopressin uh, by minimal amounts, that is, for, from 0.5 to 3 picograms per milliliter. This is the antidiuretic effect, very sensitive. On the right part of your slide, if you decrease the blood pressure in humans, uh, by uh, stopping, for example, the vasoconstrictor effect of, um, of adrenaline, you will decrease blood pressure, and as a consequence, there will be uh, an increase in vasopressin up to 100 picograms per milliliter, and this is the vasoconstrictor effect. So both effects, V2 effects, the antidiuretic, and V1 effects are quite important physiologically. Next slide, please. So this is arginine vasopressin. It's a small hormone, nine amino acids, and uh, you can take out an amino terminal here, as demonstrated here, and obtain DDAVP, desaminodextrogyre arginine vasopressin, which is more potent on the V2 type of receptor and used in central diabetes insipidus when there is deficiency of the hormone per se. Next slide, please. So uh, this is uh, the dehydrated picture of a patient in the old time with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Maybe you have seen that Lucas already took some water, uh, you know, at the beginning of this talk. And uh, this uh, young uh, patient here uh, uh, published uh, a long time ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, 1967, was suffering from nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, diabetes insipidus renalis. And it, in fact, uh, he was studied by John Crawford. John Crawford was the head of pediatrics at Harvard in Boston. And um, so the poor nutrition and the dehydration were known as uh, some kind of specific features of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And Bodeco and Crawford published a large family tree in uh, 1969 from Nova Scotia, Canada. Next slide, please. So I had the uh, uh, the privilege to uh, study patients with nephrogenic
cryogenic diabetes insipidus from Quebec, not originating from Nova Scotia. And I compared them with normal subjects, with patients with central diabetes insipidus, with a mother of patients with X-linked nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and two male patients on the bottom of this slide with congenital nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And like Nina Knurs in Nijmegen, way back in 1988, we demonstrated that we infused DDAVP, the antidiuretic hormone, they were not responding as far as the kidney is concerned, and they were not decreasing their blood pressure, suggesting that there was a vasodilating normal effect of V2, of V2 agonist in these patients. So it was a nice paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in the next slide, we demonstrated also, like Nina Knurs did, in a lot of um, uh, her patients, uh, that uh, these uh, patients were not stimulating their coagulation factors, that is factor 8C in response to DDAVP that was used at the time to treat some rare blood disorders characterized by defected coagulations. Next slide, demonstrate that uh, we uh, uh, showed that it was a pre-cyclic AMP defect. Hormones uh, like vasopressin on the V2 receptor act on the kidney to stimulate a second messenger, which is cyclic AMP. And on this slide, we took some patients, male patients with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, demonstrated a normal response to adrenaline, as demonstrated on your left, part of the slide as compared to DDAVP and on DDAVP there was no increase and this is a flat line on uh, the right part of uh, this slide as compared to normal patients these are the squares so this was a pre-cyclic AMP defect next slide please at the same time, uh, it was uh, very well known that uh, vasopressin was acting on the distal part of the nephron, and uh, which is represented here on your right part. This is a single nephron. There are one million nephron in each kidney. And as you can see here, there is increased permeability, that is reabsorption of water in the distal part of the nephron. Adults present around 12 liters there, of almost final urine. And as you know, we excrete normally without any disease around 1.5 to 2 liters per day. And due to the action of vasopressin on this terminal part, which is interacting with the vasopressin V2 receptor. Next slide, please. So that looking back at uh, this large Hopewell kindred, from Nova Scotia with males affected with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, we were quite interested to see the, uh, 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 the inheritance of uh, this disease with XQ28 markers. In um, 1988, it was well known uh, that uh, this gene for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus was localized on the X chromosome. So since it has been assigned to this type of region, uh, we uh, went to uh, Nova Scotia, obtained blood of all these members of this large family described years before by Bode and Crawford, and we demonstrated that they had the special signature. That means that markers on the XQ28 region were specific for this family and were different from other families from Quebec uh, in Canada with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And this is the next slide, please. So uh, these are the markers for the haplotype for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus in Nova Scotia that have been seen uh, as descendants um, in multiple uh, individuals of this family. And the next slide demonstrate that uh, when uh, we uh, tested Quebec families, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, all affected with the same nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, 
they shared some different markers. That means the XQ28 signature was different. And uh, to us, this was an indication that they were not from the same family tree. And in fact, we demonstrated by uh, ancestral research that they did not originate from the original family from Nova Scotia, and they were not related, suggesting that these different haplotypes would suggest different mutations in the same gene and responsible for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And we published that, as you can see, in 1992. Next slide, please. At the same time, at, uh, as mentioned by Tom, we were lucky to uh, collaborate with uh, Marielle Bernbaumer from Houston, who was interested uh, to clone the vasopressin V2 receptor. And uh, she did uh, some cloning by expression using some cells and determining the one that would stimulate cyclic AMP. She obtained some sequence of the vasopressin V2 receptor. And uh, this is a small gene with, uh, 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 with three exons and 371 amino acids. And we were able, as demonstrated here in Nature in 1992, to demonstrate that affected member of this small family in Quebec were affected uh, with um, uh, uh, deletion, as you can see here, in one out of six consecutive guanosine, and responsible, obviously, for loss of function of the vasopressin B2 receptor. Next slide, please. So it's interesting that uh, before all that work, the excellent inheritance was well described in the Bible in the Bible, you know, the books of uh, the family books of these patients living in Nova Scotia. And they were attributing this disease to some kind of curse, which is the water drinker curse. And uh, they attributed this curse uh, either to a gypsy woman or a North American Indian woman were traveling the road, as you can see, and became thirsty and posing at the well in front of a house in Nova Scotia, the gypsy or the North American Indian requested water for her son, her son, an excellent inheritance. The housewife refused, she was afraid, and, and the gypsy or the North American Indian woman cast upon her a curse. Henceforth, the story goes, all the women's sons would be afflicted with a craving for water, and the curse would be passed on by her daughters and visited upon their sons for generations to come. And it has been 11 generations so far. And the next slide uh, describes the curse indeed because the curse of this large family from Nova Scotia who according to Bode and Crawford were coming from the ship Hopewell who arrived in Nova Scotia in 1767 but we were able uh, to uh, reconstruct this family tree and to uh, demonstrate um, uh, that in fact um, uh, other ancestors were there before the Hopewell and so that most probably other uh, individuals uh, arrived in Nova Scotia before the Hopewell. So the Hopewell is a nice story, but most probably it's not exactly accurate. Next slide, please. And um, I think the curse is here. It is, um, uh, you see, instead of a TGG sequence, the normal sequence coding for tryptophan at the right part of your slide, you have a TGA sequence in the Hopewell pedigree coding for a stop codon on amino acid 71 that is very early on in the vasopressin B2 receptor sequence of 371 amino acids. So obviously, this seven transmembrane domain uh, will um, lose its function since he has, it has only uh, one transmembrane domain. Next slide, please. And uh, we were able to do um, some perinatal diagnosis, as you can see here from other members 
of this Hopewell pedigree, we benefited uh, from um, this um, uh, restriction fragment length uh, polymorphism analysis and uh, from this digestion. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate early on on new infants, right from the birth, from the cord, uh, uh, that uh, this uh, new uh, baby with an interrogation point indeed had already nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. We provided him with enough water and he never suffered uh, any episodes of uh, dehydration and this was in 1994, so he's a young man now. Next slide, please. So, uh, obviously, early on, as we suggested by haplotype analysis, uh, we were able to demonstrate that the Hopewell mutation was different from the Quebec um, uh, uh, mutations or Quebec families. Here, a Q3 family here with a different type of mutation or from a large Utah kindred. At the time of Bode, Crawford and Crawford, they studied also a large family from Utah, and uh, they thought that they found some common names, maybe linking them to the Hopewell pedigree, uh, but they were too much enthusiastic. And um, at this uh, time, you know, in 1993, we demonstrated that the independent origins of all these um, type of families with different mutations responsible, all of them for loss of function of the vasopressin B2 receptor gene. Next slide, please. So uh, this uh, boy, as I told you, <clears throat> is represented in an other publication, not from Bode and Crawford, but uh, from um, a, a, a geneticist, in fact, uh, from Vancouver. Uh, and um, the picture on your left demonstrates this unfortunate child with severe dehydration and malnutrition. The same child on your right, when he was uh, rehydrated and uh, provided some better nutrition, uh, we were able to contact the mother of this uh, child as well as the sister. And uh, yeah, despite the fact that this uh, child uh, died after many episodes of dehydration, we demonstrated that the mother carried on this Hopewell mutation as well as a sister. So definitely, he's a Hopewell boy. Next slide, please. So uh, here, uh, a large number of ancestrally independent AVPR2 uh, mutations uh, described in a recent publication together with uh, Nina Knoos from the uh, Netherlands and from uh, uh, Dr. Levetchenko. As you can see here, the seven transmembrane domains are represented with all the amino acids and missense mutations. That means uh, mutations where one amino acid is replaced by another amino acid. Uh, amino acids are represented with those um, red dots. And as you can see, these mutations are everywhere and in fact are inducing misfolding of this vasopressin V2 receptor. And hence, this uh, V2 receptor cannot function. Next slide, please. So uh, usually uh, there is uh, severe polyuria, that means these patients with nephrogenic diabetes and insipidus cannot uh, reabsorb the vasopressin on the collecting duct where these 12 liters of almost final urine are presented. And all the mutations have a similar consequence except some rare patients, for example, bearing a mutation here, valine 88 methionine. And as you can see from uh, this um, family tree, some of these patients respond to uh, DDAVP and look as if they have central diabetes insipidus. This is very rare. And anyway, uh, the dehydration episodes are less in these patients, but uh, this is demonstrating the importance of sequencing in every family the gene responsible for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. It's a small sequence 
and uh, every lab um, in Europe, in USA, is doing that. And um, if you have trouble uh, obtaining some sequencing, you can always send me some DNA. I will do them freely for you. Next slide, please. So the incident here, it's a rare disease. And uh, in Quebec, uh, we estimated the incidence of X-linked nephrogenic diabetes and cibidus because I believe that we recruited all the patients in this uh, province. And it is 8.8 .8 million male live birth. And so obviously from Nova Scotia, there is a, a founder effect and uh, the uh, incidence and prevalence is uh, higher than that, but it is a very rare disease. Next slide, please. So, uh, uh, so I told you about the loss of function of um, this um, vasopressin V2 receptor gene, and uh, so that um, uh, we also identified some gain of function. It's even more rare than excelling nephrogenic diabetes and cibidus. And the picture, the clinical picture is a reverse. That means instead of uh, dehydration, you have excess water. And then it, instead of having hypernatremia, uh, when this polyuria is not compensated by thirst, you will have hyponatremia. And so that uh, what is interesting here is that that residue in blue here uh, could be changed either to a cysteine or to a leucine or another residue here in 229 uh, could also be responsible for this gain of function. Next slide, please demonstrate the first publication of um, this gain of function, which is called nephrogenic syndrome of inappropriate Antidiuresis. It is not diuresis, it is antidiuresis. And patients one and patients two here at three months or at 2.5 months were characterized by irritability, low sodium, that means edema in the brain, and um, vasopressin, circulating vasopressin that is suppressed because they, there is a gain of function of the vasopressin V2 receptor. Next slide, please. And um, so that um, obviously uh, it was difficult to understand because we have a flat representation here of the vasopressin V2 receptor. But next slide, uh, recently uh, there have been some uh, cryo electron microscopy studies uh, demonstrating uh, some better picture. In fact, um, around um, uh, uh, two angstrom resolution of uh, this region, uh, that is uh, uh, the region around arginine 137. And uh, uh, these investigators localized in Montpellier, Bousse, and Mouillac demonstrated uh, either inactive here uh, estrogen. Uh, receptor compared to an active vasopressin V2 receptor and uh, with a specific interaction there and there is a yeah, ionic lock explaining why changing amino acid in this region will be responsible either for loss of function or gain of function. So there are further studies concerning understanding of uh, the vasopressin V2 receptor and possible treatment obviously. Next slide please. Next. So uh, that uh, again, this is the paper of Bush, and so that he was able to demonstrate either congenital nephrogenic diabetes and cibidus on your left in the base of this slide, that is the R137 residue, which is changed to histidine or to gain of function on your right where you have uh, the same amino acid, 137, that is replaced by a leucine or by a cysteine. And uh, so that um, uh, this uh, uh, D136, that is the amino acid very close to uh, R137, uh, so is important for this ionic clock. And so that uh, this iron clock is changed by these different mutants. Next slide, please. 
So I will tell you uh, in the last few minutes uh, remaining uh, the importance of detecting early nephrogenic diabetes insipidus uh, doing uh, mutation analysis and providing uh, immediate treatment. And uh, this is a publication by another distinguished investigator who is Dietlef Bockenauer working in London, UK. And uh, as you can see here, we published this in uh, 2017. And um, uh, Dietlef uh, saw a 20-month-old boy presented to his general practitioner with polyuria, polydipsia, that means um, increased thirst. Thirst is completely normal in patients with uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and is protecting the patients, in fact, against dehydration. And so uh, <clears throat> this 20-month-old boy uh, was passing three liters per day. This is enormous, you know, uh, because adults, as I told you, pass around two liters per day. So a diagnosis, in fact, of diabetes insipidus was made as it was confirmed by a dehydration test. I will tell you that dehydration tests are not necessary if your plasma sodium is already 145, because at 145, you have maximal stimulation of arginine vasopressin, the antidiuretic hormone. Hence, your osmolality, your urine osmolality, should be around 300 and more at that time. So water deprivation test, no. Do not do that. Just measure the plasma sodium. They have some difficulties to keep the plasma sodium normal. And 145, you know, uh, you are safe. So during the water deprivation test, this plasma sodium, this plasma sodium and osmolality rose to 159. 159 is too high, you know. You should never go over 150. And from 145 to 150, you do not need these numbers. 145 is sufficient. And urine osmolality stayed, stayed at 100. Usually, urinary osmolality at these levels of plasma sodium is maximally concentrated. That means higher than 300. It was only 100 milliosome. So they did a DDAVP test, okay, they should have not done, they should have done a DDAVP test under normal hydration. And as you can see here, pre-63, post-65. And so that uh, this boy had some kind of food aversion because when they drink too much, you know, and this has been well demonstrated in experimental studies with animals with diabetes insipidus, there is some food aversion. And uh, the uh, general practitioner was willing to check about magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, which again was not necessary. Next slide, please. This was published in 2017. We should be better you know, in 2017 or 2022. So despite the diagnosis of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, um, uh, there was some further dehydration. The plasma sodium increased to 174. He received 0.9% uh, saline. These persons should not receive saline when they are dehydrated. She, they should receive D5W. And, you know, there was further uh, uh, deterioration of his brain and uh, uh, some evidence of uh, some uh, further deterioration that we call demyelination. Next slide, please. So we always publish these things telling, uh, you know, physicians and colleagues that we should do better. And this is a simple explanation here if you infused one liter of saline, you know, so that uh, one liter of water will be excreted and um, there will be some increase in sodium balance here. And so that in a patient of 10 kilogram with a seven liters of estimated total body water, in fact, your plasma sodium will further increase of 20 millimoles of 20 milli equivalents, which is extremely dangerous. Next slide, please. Next. So uh, this is um, a, a picture, no, a previous one, please. Uh, this is a, a picture 
from the chapter uh, that we published recently uh, with uh, Nina Knurs, uh, telling some kind of mechanistic view about how vasopressin is acting on the uh, principal cell of the collecting duct to uh, increase aquaporin 2 expression so that vasopressin is recognized on the basolateral part of the cell that is on the right part of your cell by this vasopressin V2 receptor, uh, which is crystallized now and will induce some increase in cyclic MP, you know, what I was looking for in my experiments in 88, demonstrating that it was, there was no stimulation of plasma cyclic MP in these patients. Plasma cyclic MP uh, will facilitate uh, the relocalization of aquaporin 2, uh, that is water channel specific for the collecting duct to the luminal part, which is on the left part of your slide. And then this membrane will be for the first time permeable and permit the transport of 11 liters of water through these cells, you know, through these cells, not uh, paralateral, uh, you know, uh, through these cells and be um, some way reabsorbed by other water channels, aquaporin 3 and aquaporin 4. And next slide uh, demonstrate um, uh, the work also of us and also other investigators like Pete Dane in um, uh, Nijmegen who clone with uh, together with Sasaki, uh, the gene responsible for aquaporin. And uh, this is a smaller type of gene, a smaller type of uh, water channel. So it's a water channel, uh, as you can see here, six transmembrane domain. It is crystallized also, and all those mutations in red dots are indicating mutations that are mutated. It is not an X-linked gene, it is an autosomal gene. So you need both parents to be carriers, or there are some rare uh, patients uh, with carboxyterminal mutations uh, with a milder type of phenotype. And so you would find nephrogenic diabetes insipidus due to loss of function of aquaporins in mainly inbred families from special population. And for example, you know that if you are from Syria, from Iran, from uh, uh, the Bangladesh, um, you might uh, originate from a family um, uh, with inbreeding and there will be more prevalence of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus due to aquaporin 2 mutations in these particular kindreds. Next slide, please. Um, uh, uh, so that you can do what Peter Agre did, that is Peter Agre received the Nobel Prize uh, because uh, he cloned uh, and characterized the uh, gene responsible for aquaporin 1. And so that uh, you can look at the function of these aquaporin 2 mutants. Uh, this is work done in my lab. So you prepare the xenopisocytes, which are cells, and uh, which when transfected with the aquaporin 2 will increase their permeability. You do that under the microscope and you demonstrate some increased water content of uh, these uh, xenopus oocytes. So it's easy to demonstrate the loss of function, uh, for example, of uh, G196D uh, or some partial loss of function like uh, this other mutation, D150E. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, I described to you the identification of AVPR2, the gene responsible for X-linked nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And um, it, this was obviously facilitated by clinical observations uh, looking at also low urinary osmolality after uh, GDAVP. I spoke to you a pre cyclic AMP defect. All the work on XQ28 markers done by my team and by other teams in Europe, the ancestrally independent uh, families, the gain of function of AVPR2 with hypolatremia. I'm insisting on pre and perinatal testing. And uh, we have uh, only indirect type of treatments for the moment. We hope to have more direct treatments in the future. And the last slide, next please. Uh, 
so obviously uh, this uh, work uh, has been uh, work of a team in uh, my uh, labo laboratory and clinical research unit. I thank all the patients, obviously, who did all these tests and were kind enough with my team and were able to obtain a lot of new information. And as I mentioned before, we continue to receive blood from hereditary polyuric patients and we continue to provide free sequencing analysis for ADPR2 and uh, AQP2G. I thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Bichet. I think that the idea now was that uh, Lucas would uh, present his um, uh, talk on, uh, let's say, the patient side of diabetes insipidus. Lucas? Yes, sure. I'll take it from here. Thank you. Um, so, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Lucas van Baalen, and uh, I've been diagnosed with ND uh, since, I, uh, since I was nine months old. Um, for the moment, I'm 16 years old, and uh, at this moment, I drink around 15 liters of water uh, and also need to go to the toilet a lot. Um, but I found a way to live with this disease, and I wish to share some of my own personal experiences with you to help diagnose some people and treat them right. Uh, if you would like to ask some questions, um, go ahead and I'll be happy to of uh, the webinar. Um, so let's start with our first subject, physical impacts. Um, I think I was never able to fully reach my physical potential as I was always, uh, I would have to keep some things in mind. Um, two things mainly. Can I do this with the physical condition I have? Uh, I have the feeling that due to the disease, I am tired and exhausted a lot faster. And uh, reason number two is, Will I have enough water during the exercise? Um, as you know, I need lots and lots of water, even without any physical activity. But when I'm going to exhaust myself by doing doing an activity, I need even more. Uh, and this gives extra, extra stress, which isn't necessary. Um, and for example, doing a long running trail would be exceptionally hard. It would be doable, but it would be hard. If you keep in mind that I easily drink two liters of water during physical uh, activity in medium heat. Um, and afterwards, I will also need some time to regenerate myself. Um, as I'm constantly searching for the boundaries of what I can and can't do, um, sometimes not everything goes according to plan. Um, whenever I'm getting dehydrated, I can recognize following symptoms. After one hour without hydration, some things in my head will shut down one by one. Uh, first comes attentiveness. It comes very hard to concentrate myself, uh, for example, at school. And uh, I will constantly zone out of uh, where I am at the moment. Uh, after that comes insights. Thinking becomes harder and harder. Lucas, can, can I uh, interrupt you for a moment? Um, I, I'm not sure whether we are actually seeing your slides. Um, I, I'm, I am still seeing your uh, title slide. Is that OK? Oh. Or? Um, normally not. Uh, wait up. I'll try something here. Um, are if you, you go down to. to uh, I found a problem. Um, I was still focusing on the um, webinar. So now you can see my... Um... Okay, yes, yes, yes certainly okay. we can see. Perfect, perfect. Sorry for the interruption. No, uh, no worries. Um, where was I? Um, yes. um, whenever I lost my insights, uh, it becomes harder and harder, and uh, I will get really sleepy. Uh, and afterwards comes the ability to orientate myself. Um, but, uh, at last, I sometimes get a uh, real pain in my chest, um, but it almost never gets to this stage. After some time, I was able to recognize these characteristics and those uh, symptoms, and I will get myself or take someone else um, to help me. Um, one thing uh, extra to keep in mind is that I don't think I need that much of sleep. Um, for example, on a typical night where I go to sleep at around 10 and get up at 7 p.m., um, I usually get up six or seven times to drink or to go to the toilets. Um, during the night, I also drink around three liters of water. Uh, although I only get up for a minute or two, uh, it still breaks up my sleep pattern. Uh, whenever my usual sleeping pattern is interrupted, I'm very emotional, very cranky. Doing uh, daily stuff is very hard. Um, and mental impact. Um, as I just said, sleeping is a challenge which makes things extra difficult um when i was younger but now i get up in time if i have to go to the toilets um but back then i needed diapers and there was always the risk of having a wet bed if you uh 
if you wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, it took a pretty long time for me to get trained to wake up in time. Um, and I had to make sure I had the bed close to the toilet or if there aren't any ob obstacles on the way. And this, this too gives extra stress that isn't necessary. Um, normally, if I uh, had to sleep in an unknown area, for example, um, if I'm going out with friends, um, one night for me will always have um, bad, yeah, how do I explain this? I will have a bad, uh, very bad uh, sleep. But after a few days, it gets better. And after the third night, uh, I, will, uh, I will be able to sleep as, uh, as I would in my own bed. Um, something that bothers me yeah, that is that I see that other people can do things that I can't. Um, heavy sports or a full night's sleep are things I can only dream of. Um, now, this disease formed me to who I am as a person. I'm really happy that I don't have any other kind of disease. But I think it's safe to say there are um, that the, uh, mental challenges you get with the disease are, um, yeah, are um, the mental impact on my personality and how I see the disease is as big and maybe even bigger than the physical impact. Um, but I don't suffer any physical pain and I'm not in danger to life. So to me, those are neglectable. Um, the thing that bothers me about other people is that they kind of see me as a novelty. Um, like, look, there's a the guy who chucks 15 liters of water a day. Uh, they tend to see my kidney disease as my whole personality, which it is not, of course. Um, but luckily, after a few weeks, it usually goes over their head and everything goes back to normal. Uh, sometimes they also think that I have some privileges today uh, that they don't. For example, they can't drink at school, but I can, for, uh, but I can for example. Um, and when I was younger, I couldn't explain uh, that well to other people what I exactly had and what I suffered from. But now, after a few years, uh, years that got better. And I can tell them what's wrong, um, why I can't do things they can't, for example. Um, one thing I have to note is that I have few people, uh, a few people who, can, uh, who I can communicate with, and uh, uh, they really help to, um, for me to soften the disease and how I, um, how I experience it. Um, one last thing is um, the medications that I take. Um, Modernitic and Inometacid, uh, they don't get paid back by um, any type of uh, insurance. That's one thing I thought was uh, helpful to note, um, but that was all. Um, I hope it was some kind of helpful. Um, I will now switch off my screen and uh, back to you. Well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lucas. I think this was a good or at least uh, uh, I hope this was a good overview of living with uh, uh, diabetes symptoms because of course I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, if I understand correctly, uh, Danielle, you first wanted to do some poll questions before we come to the uh, questions from the question box. Yes, indeed. So uh, Stephanie has uh, those, uh, yes. So, so that uh, I prepared some some two slides in fact uh, and uh, so i was willing to say congenital and progenic diabetes and is usually recognized during the first week of life and so that uh, i did not develop that uh, completely but i have um, uh, a tremendous experience concerning that since i've followed many families with nephrogenic diabetes and and uh, i've been able to um, uh, to obtain some uh, clinical uh, information and blood test for the first week of life of new children with nephrogenic diabetes and sepidus. And uh, if uh, you look at the urine the first day of life, in fact, you will find increased urine. You will uh, find um, uh, uh, decreased uh, urine osmolality, which is easy to find. And if you do some uh, plasma sodium measurements, you will find them already slightly increased so that uh, there is no reason to delay the diagnosis of patients with nephrogenic diabetes and syphilis. So uh, my second uh, point here, early symptoms include polyuria thirst, as I was saying, and as Lucas demonstrated beautifully, thirst is protecting. And so that, uh, you know, uh, they uh, protect against uh, this constant polyuria. And uh, if there is some physical activity with sweating, 
or um, having physical activity in some kind of hot environment, uh, you know, obviously there will be a need uh, to increase um, the uh, consumption of fluid. So that early symptoms could uh, include dehydration, hypernatremia, and it's easy to check urine. So, so that, uh, you know, simple clinical observations and simple uh, measurements. You do not need any DNA testing at that time, but obviously it is important to obtain it as soon as you can. Dehydration test, my third point, should not be done if plasma sodium is higher than 145 with a concomitant urinary osmolality less than 200. You do not need dehydration test, you know, in polyuric patients, this is very important. This is very painful and dangerous, as I demonstrated. This is an X-linked disease, so there is no father-to-son transmission. You ask that most of the families bear some ancestral mutation, but there is a possibility of de novo mutations. We have observed that in around um, 15 to 20 percent of cases, so that there could be a possibility of de novo mutation, that is, uh, an hereditary disease without any heredity. So uh, there is no father to son transmission with the possibility of heterozygous expressing females. Females have two X chromosomes. One of these X chromosomes in, um, in, uh, uh, in uh, expressing females will have this uh, mutation. The other X chromosome might be lionized. That is, uh, you know, they will also be polyuria. Uh, they will also have polyuria and polydipsia. So all these type of statements are true. If I could have the next um, slide of questions, please. So uh, obviously, the first bullet here is false. Administration of vasopressin or DDAVP will rapidly increase urine osmolality and prevent dehydration episodes in nephrogenic patients. This is not true. This is how we distinguish central, that is vasopressin deficient, and nephrogenic, that is vasopressin resistant, diabetes insipidus. So except in extremely rare cases like V88M mutation, uh, you know, some kind of mild phenotype, but if you are faced with a, a, a dehydrated young boy with repeated episodes of dehydration, he is likely not to bear that V88M mutation that may be described later, you know, with extensive family tree reconstruction. So the first bullet is false. All the other ones are true. We recommend a mutational analysis in every family with hereditary nephrogenic diabetes and syphilis. Uh, the results of this mutational analysis should be given to the patients themselves. You know, they have the right to know. And uh, so, as with that, we can identify at risk heterozygous females and use perinatal testing to prevent dehydration episodes in children. We are we are used to obtain. Uh, one tube, one lavender tube uh, that is containing EGTA, an anticoagulant, from the cord of every uh, boy at risk uh, to have nephrogenic diabetes insipidus born from uh, a known uh, carrier of the uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus gene. Uh, it is easy to do that type of sequencing, um, uh, you know, in a few days. We take two days, in fact, after extracting uh, the blood. Uh, often uh, we used uh, some, um, uh, uh, some markers that are characteristic of this family and segregating perf perfectly with the disease. So you have to have just the mutation analysis, amplifying only that region of the gene bearing the mutation, uh, and so that it is it is simple. Uh, Dietlev Bockenauer is doing it. Uh, Nina Knur is doing it. So that um, and uh, uh, Vargas Pusu in Paris is doing it on patients um, uh, from France. So I think we should uh, implement uh, those uh, type of easy genetic tests. Intravenous administration of 
physiological, that is 0.9% normal, saline is dangerous in polyuric nephrogenic patients because they will retain the sodium and excrete the water. You can induce severe hypernatremia. It's forbidden to do that in Canada or in the US. A lawyer will sue you if you are doing that. You know, it's uh, very much important. And uh, you should know the reverse of uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, that is the nephrogenic syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis, which is due to gain of function of the AVPR2 receptor. So, uh, you know, to me, these are simple questions. Uh, the best is to see patients like you have seen Lucas, and also to look for uh, patients in your environment, you know, in your pediatric clinic, and so this is very important. So these are my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, both uh, Daniel and uh, Lucas. Um, I'm looking at the question box uh, uh, here because there are some questions um, uh, for, um, I, I think, mainly uh, for Professor Bichet, but we'll, we'll see uh, as we go along. Um, I have one question which says, um, uh, what is the risk of uh, mega ureters uh, with diabetes insipidus and how that's to manage this? That's very important. Maybe I should have mentioned that. There's so much urine flow uh, in these patients that most of them, uh, at least 40 to 50%, develop dilations of the urinary tract. And, um, and uh, it is preventable if you do uh, double voiding. That means that there's so much water to excrete and the capacity of the urinary bladder is enlarged, is uh, high. And so that usually, you know, these boys with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus or young adults uh, urinate around 400 cc's, empty their 400 cc's bladder. Sometimes um, they forget to go to the bathroom or they would like to control that. And this is inducing dilations of the urinary bladder with reflux in the ureter and some type of obstructive nephropathy uh, with some uh, kind of thinning of uh, the uh, uh, renal cortex and possibility of obstructive renal failure. So we should do some ultrasound uh, every year, some uh, abdominal ultrasound to look for these types of dilation, implement double voiding in these uh, patients. And in most of the cases, it is, uh, it is uh, very useful. Sometimes when they are 16, they forgot all about this. And so when you see them at the clinic, you show them this uh, increased dilation of the uh, urinary bladder. And, um, and so that some urologists have put some catheter, some permanent catheter. Usually we do not need that, or we uh, need some permanent catheter during one or two weeks. And after that, you force the patients to do some double voiding. So it's an important long-term management. Very important question. Yes. And maybe uh, um, uh, along the same lines, a question to Lucas, how do you actually do that at night? Because uh, do you wait until you uh, need to go to the toilet or do you go to the toilet, um, uh, let's say, based on a clock or? Yeah. Um, when I was younger, we did that in fact, um, because it was a big struggle to to keep refreshing the bed, the, uh, the sheets, uh, because it, it happened really much that, um, that I wet my bed. But um, now I just wake up from uh, that I need to pee. I feel the need to pee. Uh, I go downstairs, I go to the toilets, and I go back in bed, and that's all in three minutes. But I really feel the need to pee. Um, so it's not based on a clock or something or on an alarm. But when I was younger, we did that, in fact. Um, I don't know how to say this in English. Um, uh, in Dutch, we call it a plaswekker. Maybe you can translate it. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mr. I also don't know how you call it in, in English, yes, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an alarm clock to make you pee, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think when it gets wet, it rings a bell, and then you know, oh, shit, I have to go to the toilet. Yes, and it, it induces some kind of reflex, you know, like a Pavlov type of reflex, obviously. Okay. And, and so that uh, 
uh, obviously these uh, young boys they, they are used uh, to be trained like that uh, some family use two beds you know and uh, so they go from one bed uh, to to another uh, lucas so do I, you do I you kind of, and i put in between myself and my uh, my mattress and whenever i wet my bed i just up away and i went to bed uh, again so we had solutions we had to uh, and uh, Lucas, uh, do you um, uh, do you have some uh, echo, some ultrasounds, uh, surveillance of your kidneys to uh, to make sure that uh, you are not developing uh, dilation of the urinary tract? Uh, how do you do it? Uh, every three months, I um, go to the Universal Hospital of Leuven, uh, where Levchenko is working, and I think every yes. three months or every six months we get an uh, an echo, so we keep it. Uh, yeah, we keep an eye on it. Perfect. Excellent. Thank yes. you. Um, again, looking at the, um, at, at the question box, um, there is also a question uh, about the role of copeptin in diabetes insipidus. And I guess the question is, uh, is related to diagnosis. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, uh, copeptin is uh, the... Uh, last part of the vasopressin gene that is the gene coding for the hormone vasopressin and there's a signal sequence you know and then you know, there is this nine amino acid sequence uh, uh, nine amino acid um, uh, uh, sequence produced by obviously uh, 27 um, uh, 27 different base pairs and then there is a neurophysine in the same gene that is um, uh, that is a transporter of vasopressin the hormone in um, the hypothalamus and the last part is a copeptin copeptin is very nice so that it's um, it is produced in uh, uh, equal quantities as compared to vasopressin and vasopressin is difficult to measure as compared to copeptin which could be measured by some ELISA some simpler type of um, uh, measurements and so that there is an excellent correspondence in between measurements of vasopressin and measurements of copeptin so that in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, um, obviously due to constant dehydration, vasopressin will be high, you know, trying to compensate. And this is a very nice diagnosis as compared to central diabetes insipidus, where you have a deficiency in vasopressin. And so that a group in, uh, in basal uh, has um, extensive data concerning the use of copeptin to distinguish between uh, uh, to the central diabetes insipidus and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And uh, I remember the numbers. If uh, your copeptin is higher than 24, uh, you are likely almost certain to have nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So uh, these are important. Obviously, in some centers in Europe, you can obtain some copeptin levels in a matter of uh, one day or 24 hours. So this is useful, obviously. Uh, but what you need to do is to look at urinary osmolality. You can obtain that in minutes from your central lab. And uh, your urinary osmolality responds to DDAVP. And again, you could have obtained in minutes um, uh, in your lab after uh, giving one microgram subcutaneously of DDAVP. So copeptin levels are important. Uh, for sure, are important to diagnose central versus nephrogenic diabetes and sepidus. So, uh, but uh, clinical observations, hereditary type of um, of data, uh, are also uh, very important. But uh, I do not negate uh, the importance of these new copeptin measurements. Yes. Maybe a little bit along those lines. Uh, another question is, is a urinary specific gravity over 1020 reliable enough to help to exclude a urinary concentrating defect? Yes, it's not so. Uh, so uh, 1, uh, 0, 020 is indicating some concentrations. So yes, usually it's quite good. You can exclude nephrogenic diabetes insipidus with that. But again, there are some partial nephrogenic diabetes and sepidus, and you could obtain this type of specific gravity with severe dehydration. So indeed, if it is um, 1,020 with a plasma sodium 
of um, uh, 145, this is reliable. But if it is obtained with a plasma sodium of 155, no, it's not reliable. Uh, because at the time, uh, it is too much concentrated, the plasma sodium, the dehydration is too much important. And the urinary osmolarity is so easy to obtain. But, you know, I would accept to have a specific gravity also as some kind of screening um, uh, type of test. Yes. Um, uh, and, and again, about the, the serum sodium level, um, yes. another question that is asked is, what is a, a total rated sodium value when managing children with NDI? Um, because um, uh, yes. uh, Dr. Bogdan Bulatra uh, um, uh, uh, tells us that it's sometimes difficult to keep it below 148. True, true. So that... Uh, <clears throat> So that 148, what is below 150 is acceptable. Uh, what is below 150 and also what is compatible with uh, not only uh, quenching of thirst, but also adequate food consumption. Because if you drink too much, um, uh, you will have less um, space. Uh, for solid food or you, you know these children it's rare that they take solid food I did not mention but for example the osmolality of the uh, milk of the human milk of the milk from the mother is lower than uh, cow milk and um, uh, children with nephrogenic diabetes and diabetes are better if they are breastfed uh, for uh, a long uh, a long time so I will accept 148 um, uh, but i will tend to uh, to obtain 146 and um, you know, lucas mentioned uh, that he has been taking uh, hydrochlorothiazide and indomethacin and uh, these combinations of those two drugs is very helpful in most of the patients with nephrogenic diabetes and diabetes together with the low sodium diet the low sodium diet does not have to be seven days a week you know we could uh, we could sometimes uh, make um, at least one me meal with a little bit of more of sodium. It's very important to have the collaboration of uh, the dietitian uh, concerning uh, these patients and to provide some food that will be also uh, high in liquid and palatable uh, to uh, these children. So 145, uh, 148 is, is acceptable, but I tend to have with the dietitian with uh, really the combination of these drugs, hydrochlorothiazide, amyloid, uh, indomethacid, uh, some uh, better control. With a low sodium diet, we can decrease uh, water uh, output uh, by 30%, you know, 30 to 40%, which is huge. Uh, and this has been uh, well demonstrated. I wish I had uh, some better treatment, but maybe it's coming, uh, it's coming along, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, maybe a question to Lucas uh, along the same lines. Do you uh, do you experience the difference between uh, whether you uh, eat uh, salt or eat a uh, salt deficient uh, diet? Um, uh, yes. <laughs> um, for example, when I eat salty snacks like uh, a bit of chips, or um, when I go um, to get uh, go out with friends and I eat fries or something like that, and I put extra salt on it, which I normally don't do, of course. But if they do it at uh, um if the cook does it i really uh, really feel it in the next one to two hours um but normally um the normal diet that i follow is not really that strict and then i won't feel it but when it's something extreme like fast food or like um as i said chips then i can really feel it um, my mouth will get really dry and i will feel the need to constantly drink uh, to mm -hmm. keep up with all the salt yeah um, and and a, a question from my own uh, experience, uh, um, uh, Daniel. Um, yes. I sometimes see some uh, adult patients that uh, that um, uh, uh, actually seem to overdrink, so overhydrate. So I sometimes have NDI patients which co which come in with a, a sodium level of uh, below 135 or 130 even. So are, are we completely sure that thirst sensation is normal? Or did we just so, instruct them to drink too much water? <laughs> so that's a very interesting question. Well, so we can study thirst, for example, with thirst scales. And so that uh, you uh, kind of draw 
a 10 centimeter scale on a piece of paper and you ask your patients you know how thirsty they are during the hydration test and usually uh, there is a very good uh, correlation in between plasma sodium and this dehydration scale thirst scale and also plasma vasopressin or plasma copeptin measurements so usually it's good yet uh, there are some patients that are afraid to be uh, dehydrated and to be thirsty and uh, they tend to go overboard that is they tend to replenish themselves uh, with a lot of water it's not really dangerous uh, that is to be at around 130 uh, and um, you know, some patients uh, like to do that uh, obviously uh, the thirst threshold could be different in between different individuals and so that uh, this has been studied um, uh, with patients with central diabetes sensitivity some of them need for example higher doses of TDAVP to reach a plasma sodium of 129 where they are not thirsty as compared to other patients with central again diabetes insipidus who are perfectly well with a plasma sodium of 144 so that uh, thirst has been extremely well studied uh, with optogenetic tools in animals so we know better about these things for example if you have a decrease in volume that is if your blood pressure is low uh, you will tend to be more thirsty and so that maybe uh, you know in circumstances where the blood pressure of these patients with nephrogen nephrogenic diabetes and sepidus is a little bit low maybe they would be more thirsty if they do not have any headache if uh, we keep uh, the dilation of the uh, urinary tract under control um, i will simply observe them but i will make sure that the plasma sodium is not lower let's say than 128 you know uh, just for security mm -hmm. reasons yes um and maybe also along the lines of security and treatment one of the questions in the question box was and you already mentioned that uh, just now is what do you think about the chronic treatment with uh endomedicine and i guess that refers to um possible yeah. side effects yeah so so that uh, it's it's in, it's quite interesting because uh for example, I know very well uh, the uh, my colleagues uh, uh, from uh, Necker in France uh, who have been interested. It's a pediatric hospital who have been interested also in nephrogenic diabetes and sepidus from a long time, and uh, they have been used to uh, to um, to use indomethacin despite the fact that in the US, for example, we are afraid to have some kind of gastrointestinal type of side effects and complications, including bleeding with indomethacin. But in fact, most patients do not have any of these complications, despite the fact that they take indomethacins or similar compounds, you know, um, for years. And um, you do not have to take large amounts uh, of them. And you have to take, obviously, them with food. And I've not observed either in these polyuric states or other polyuric states like Barter syndromes, who also take prostaglandin inhibitors for a long time, such type of complications. So it's like any other patients. So you observe them, you tell them what could be the gastrointestinal type of side effects, and you ask them to phone you or to phone to uh, the, the team with the nurses uh, to uh, follow that. I find them extremely useful and uh, with relatively very low type of complications but you know there are always some exceptions yes yeah. and, and and i think there, there might also be renal uh, side effects right um, no, concerning the renal side effects well uh, uh, so that uh, there have been a, a large studies uh, that was initiated by Dietlef uh, Bacanauer and other teams uh, in europe we tend to find that the normal function of adult patients with nephrogenic diabetes and syphilis is not uh, 90 or 100 percent they tend to be a bit lower but we tend to attribute that to uh, the dilation of the urinary tract and the thinning of the cortex rather than all the uh, early episodes of dehydration rather than the constant use of uh, prostaglandin inhibitors 
yes but we we have to follow we have to be careful we have to look also whether these proteinuria to go with whether whether there is some uh, overweight subjects uh, people not look as with nephrogenic diabetes and sepidus tend to gulp not only water but also food and some of them develop um, uh, uh, diabetes mellitus type 2 and so we have complications also related to that with gout and all that so uh, you know they are like uh, any other patients we have to be careful on many fronts and i guess also uh, if you take in uh, let's say your water in the in the form of uh, uh, soda yes yeah. coca-cola then you, you get a big uh, uh, carbohydrate uh, um, exactly load. there is a lot of calories there and it is dangerous so we we have to to be careful and especially during the the adolescence and uh, uh, i mentioned this hope well kindred and you know they are living in nova scotia and uh, already there is um, some tendency there to take a lot of of uh, caloric um, beverages and uh, this is detrimental indeed concerning uh, diabetes mellitus type 2 yes mm -hmm. so we are a little bit coming to the end i think of the because we are at quarter past five uh, uh, already uh, and there are still questions coming in so apparently it was a very good uh, uh, seminar um, uh, which um, which uh, um, uh, leads to a lot of questions um, I um to one... those questions uh, with the origin i could um, I, I could answer them separately uh, uh, this is no trouble for me and i'm always learning something concerning the questions you know yeah. yes yeah. so so i would suggest that we ask uh, urbnet central office to see whether they can uh, um, uh, get uh, the questions from the question uh, box to you i just don't know whether they can actually couple that to um, uh, um, to the information of the of the people but if they, if they have uh, specific questions i guess they can also uh, contact you directly right Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, they can, uh, uh, Stephanie could share my email, uh, no problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, I... Sorry, I just wanted to say uh, the best would be just to contact uh, the central office and then I can forward this to Daniel. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. sure. We'll do it that way. Um, so, in the interest of time, I would again like to thank uh, uh, Professor Bichet. I would like to thank Lucas. Uh, especially for for bringing us also the patient uh, uh, voice um, and 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 the heads up for you if the uh, uh, seminar ends then also our connection ends so we will lose you. so that's it's all, always uh, uh, feels a little bit in, in, uh, impersonal or not personal but, but just so you know um, uh, I would also like to thank everybody that joins uh, uh, today I think we had a good attendance today um, uh, and I would also like to point you to our next webinars. Uh, next week, there is uh, a joint uh, uh, ERN webinar from Eurogen, Ithaca and Urknet on uh, Down syndrome. Um, and the 4th of October, there's our uh, next uh, uh, Urknet webinar on non-cystinotic uh, non renal Fanconi syndrome by Francesco Emma. Um, and two weeks uh, later, there is our, uh, uh, another uh, webinar on rare disease aspects of pediatric dialysis by Franz Schaefer. Uh, so thank you all and hope to see you uh, at one of these next webinars. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank Have you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.